here. So my name is Nancy Gilson. I'm the director of academic degree programs at um, GPS and uh, at least on the GPS side oversee um, uh, the five-year programs, the BA MIA program with political science, the one with uh, the, the two, three actually now with international studies and also the BA MPP in, um, in the economics department. Um, uh, Natalie is your go-to person on the political science side as she is the expert in political science curriculum. Um, on our side, uh, you know, we all sort of pitch in um, uh, and do some advising and the prepping of material. Uh, let me introduce my colleague at GPS, Amy Butsadi. She's here. Um, she's sort of the technical wizard uh, um, who's really behind the green curtain instead of me. Um, uh, and so uh, if you're come and join us in the program, Amy is someone that you will get to know. So I'm just going to uh, go through the slides. Since there are not a hundred zillion of you, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and interrupt me if you have questions, if something that I say isn't uh, clear. If you have something that's off topic to what we're talking about, hang on to it. But um, as I go along, I'm happy to have you interrupt me with questions. Um, uh, I'm an interruptible lecturer uh, and sometimes have a tendency to go off tangent. So um, I'm happy to have you uh, pull me back in the direction of what you actually uh, want to know. So what's the BA MIA program? Um, so this is really, you know, um, the School of Global Policy and Strategy uh, was created um, now over 30 years ago. Uh, in those days, it was known as the, the Graduate School of International Relations and Pacific Studies. And it's really a curriculum that combines economics, political science, uh, and international management, sort of international business. And so political science is really one of the core threads that runs through all of the curriculum. And, and so having a five-year program that pulls really good students who are interested in international relations, comparative politics, um, to include the United States, by the way, um, as I think about comparative politics. I know political science departments rarely talk about the United States in comparison, um, but you should ask yourself why that's the case, by the way. Um, uh, and so having this BA MIA program where you have a, a very strong uh, disciplinary foundation in the Department of, of Political Science, and then come into um, the training for the, the Masters of International Affairs is, is it's a no-brainer in terms of just the, the way that the program is put together. And, and I think most importantly, um, one of the things that you need to understand is that the curriculum that you would take doing the five-year program where you're taking the graduate core as seniors still as undergraduates, and then one year of undergraduate court is exactly the same curriculum that the two-year master's students take. It's exactly the same. Um, so, so while uh, you are coming into it as undergraduates, there's, it's absolutely seamless, your movement into it. You become graduate students basically as undergraduates um, and have all of the opportunities and resources uh, that graduate students would have. And, and you do it, you get the master's degree uh, in essentially just one more year rather than having to apply um, and adding two years on, um, on top of getting an undergraduate degree. So if you, um, if you apply to the, the BA MIA in April of your junior year or, or your, your second or third year, depending upon whether you came in as a, as a freshman or a transfer student, um, uh, you would change your um, political science major to political science international affairs after being admitted, graduate uh, the following year after taking a year of core classes with your bachelor's degree in political science international affairs, and then do one year of graduate work and graduate again, as I said, with the very same degree that two-year students get. Um, uh, uh, you know, as they come back to the university. And it's really a program that allows you to 
um, allows you a sort of broader set of possibilities for career and study than you're going to get in any single department. Um, I'm a political scientist, my PhD is in political science, but I can tell you that, you know, getting a degree in political science doesn't let you do everything. Don't tell the professors that, but, um, you know, an MIA gives you strengths in international management, it gives you strengths in development economics, um, uh, uh, corporate social responsibility, uh, as well as the sort of traditional careers in international affairs. Um, and and you know policy making so so it's really in that sense it's an incredibly flexible and diverse um, a set of diverse opportunities. So you know here's the sort of summary of that. I mean it really does blend um, some of which you will come to us having done politics policy making um, how politics not only how politics get made how do constitutions shape the policymaking institutions? Um, but what are the politics of it? Why do you get guaranteed family income in European countries and not in the United States? And it's not just because Europe has a left and the United States doesn't. Um, the United States does, but why is the left essentially um, out of power? Uh, whereas, you know, left politics left parties in, in Europe have a voice. It has to do with the way that institutions are designed. And so understanding not only literally how does a bill become a law, like you all learned in American civics classes, but what are the politics of regulation um, making, economics, international development. Um, and you know, while GPS has a focus, its expertise is in Asia and the Americas uh, broadly, um, uh, you know, we take very seriously the idea that the United States is part of that, uh, as well as um, Mexico, Central America, Latin America, and Asia broadly understood um, to include increasingly at GPS, South Asia, uh, uh, Southeast Asia to include the Philippines, um, as well as the traditional countries of Japan, Korea, um, and China. Uh, we have students who go on to do all kinds of work in human health policy, uh, corporate social responsibility, technological advances. Uh, we've got courses in the environment um, and energy that are co-taught between G uh, GPS political scientists and um, an engineering faculty um, so, that, so that you're bringing in people who are working in the sciences or in STEM fields uh, who know what's going on with the technology. You can talk about energy all you want to, but if you don't know what's going on in the development of technology, it's sort of a little bit like raising imaginary policy um, rather than real policy if you don't know how the technology works or how it's, how it's perceived, right? So it's a, it's a really, it's a great mix of social sciences. Uh, we have faculty who do climate who are also teaching classes at SIO. Um, increasingly um, access and working with faculty over in uh, public health and in global health as well. So um, what makes you eligible? First of all, you have to be a political science major. At some point you have to uh, go see Natalie and declare your intentions. Um, uh, you have, at the time of your application, you have to have a cumulative GPA of a 3.0 or higher and a major um, GPA of 3.4. And if you look at your degree audit, you'll see um, uh, that uh, your major GPA is, is your upper division work uh, in your major is the way the audit um, uh, you know, calculates that. Amy, is there somebody waiting to get in? I'm showing that there is. Um, um, and so, you know, what we understand is that a lot of people come in uh, and uh, struggle in some of their GEs or they come in as pharmacy majors and then um, decide they want to, you know, uh, be a political scientist. And so um, sometimes your, your cumulative GPA isn't exactly um, a fair representation of, of your ability to work. And so we look at your major GPA. 
um, uh, where you've had the opportunity to do well and and sort of really you know expand uh, yourself intellectually. You have to be able to demonstrate at the time um, when you're when when you apply. We want to see that you're able to complete all or nearly all um, of your upper division political science course requirements um, by the end of your junior year. That's because the core takes up an entire year, and while there is some room in in there, depending on how hard you want to work, uh, the core um, is three courses in the fall three courses in the winter and two in spring. So taking additional, um, uh, taking additional uh, uh, courses in political science, if you still have a lot of requirements left, makes it very difficult to do well. And the workload is frankly more um, in a graduate class than it is in, in most undergraduate classes. So we like to have you be finished or nearly finished by the time you start the core. You also have to be able to demonstrate that you'll be able to reach um, sixth quarter proficiency in a GPS language by the time you graduate with the MIA. So you don't have to be able to do that by the end of your senior year, but you do have to be able to do that by the end of your graduate year. And the requirement is sixth quarter proficiency. So you don't have to take six quarters of language if you've already taken, if you have some background um, and, and you only need to take a couple more quarters. It's really the proficiency of the sixth quarter that's the requirement, okay? So it's not necessarily, um, you don't, you're not necessarily looking at two years of language depending on where you are. And depending upon what your, um, your background is, uh, we have a summer prep program in quantitative methods and in uh, microeconomics. So if you don't have any of those, in your background, we may require you to attend summer prep. Um, that's not intended to be punitive. It's intended to make sure that when you get into the core in the fall that you're really prepared. And just to give you some idea about the size of our summer prep program, um, across our three programs, um, two-year programs, the MIA, the MPP, and the uh, new degree that we have in Chinese economic and political affairs. We admit on average around 170 students a year, something like that. About 150 of them end up doing prep. Um, and so, uh, so it's really, you know, it's sort of the year begins there. The grades don't matter. It's all really introducing you to the material. So attending prep is really um, uh, to everyone's advantage. In the 10 years that I've been director, I've never heard anyone say, ah, I wish I hadn't done prep. It was such a waste of time. Um, I've heard a lot of people say, I'm glad I went. Um, I've heard people say, why didn't you require me to go? I would have gone and I would have done better. Uh, but no one ever comes back and goes, boy, was that a waste of time. Um, and so if we require you to do prep, um, and a lot of the BA MIAs end up doing it. Uh, don't look at it as if we're punishing you for not having done something that you should have done. So, so these are this is a, this sort of overview of the of of the program, and I'll talk a little bit about each of these um, as we go through. Um, but just so you get a sense of uh, you know what the what the program looks like. Um, your, your lower division requirements, your upper division requirements through the political science department, and then um, the GPS specific requirements so that you see them laid out in a sort of neat fashion here. Uh, and we'll go, I'll go through each one of these as we, as we go on. But one of the things I want to say, um, there really is, this is an incredibly well put together curriculum. Um, uh, we worked hard, uh, my colleague and I worked hard with the political science department to, to develop a set of requirements in political science that made the movement into the BA MIA program uh, really quite seamless. Uh, you will be coming in in some ways with a better background than some of the students that we admit into the two-year program. They're smart, uh, but you've got political science and we've got students who have backgrounds in um, music performance. Uh, playwriting, uh, fashion design, <laughs> uh, theater, um, uh, you know, communications, all kinds of things. And so, 
So you're really coming in in a way that is this transition is quite smooth. So the regional requirements. So it is it is you know GPS is uh, if you will um, the Asia Pacific focused. We you know facing uh, uh, the broader Asia Pacific. And, and the reason for that isn't just because we're in California and so talking about Europe doesn't really make sense. The reason for that really is that the origins of GPS was the recognition on the part of some of the faculty then in the political science department at, at UCSD that in the, in the end of the 20th century and certainly into the 21st century, the real orientation of the world was going to be toward Asia and the Americas that what was going to be where the challenges for the United States were going to be were really in their economic um, and business relations with Asia and the, and, and the Americas and not, not in military conflict in Europe. Um, and so the curriculum is, is really oriented with, with that idea in mind. So these are, this shows you the GPS regional specializations, Latin America, which includes uh, Central America and Mexico, um, and even Cuba, to, um, uh, though it's not formally Latin America, I think it's part of uh, Latin America. Um, China, uh, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asia is a broad category that includes the Philippines, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, um, and increasingly uh, those uh, air areas where, where they have relations. And um, Southeast Asia is um, a hugely diverse uh, region of the world and, and, and to have it as a single focus is a little odd. It's increasingly odd actually, but, but what it means is that um, uh, now that we have faculty that are interested in Southeast Asia more broadly, um, it used to be that you had two choices for language, Bahasa, Indonesian, um, or Mandarin. Increasingly, we have students who are using Hindi, um, uh, certainly Tagalog uh, because of the Philippines, Spanish because of the colonial presence in, in the Philippines. Um, uh, we've gone back to uh, accepting French for people who are interested in um, uh, Southeast Asia more formally, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, because of the return to an interest in French and French education in Southeast Asia. We have people who speak Tamil uh, because of the presence of minorities in places like Singapore and Malaysia. Um, and so it's, you know, the idea of what a GPS language is has expanded. We even have students who are focused on China who are using Arabic because they are interested in um, minority populations or Chinese relationships um, with, with the countries that, that ring the outer uh, border of China, many of which are Arabic speaking countries. Um, uh, we have students who are studying Latin America who uh, are using Japanese because of the importance of Japanese communities in places, for example, one of the biggest in Brazil um, and their importance in sort of economic development policies, as well as, um, in one case, uh, uh, Alberto Fujimora, um, uh, in in you know, uh, being a major figures in some of the countries. So, while these are the traditional languages accepted for the region, if you can make a good intellectual argument for the use of another language, um, we're willing to consider it uh, as well. I mean, let me just say one thing too, but that's not on this slide, which is that for those of you who are native speakers of another language, uh, who have um, perhaps gone to school in another country um, in another language because you were a military kid or you uh, 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 came to the United States as a, you know, um, after going to high school someplace, um, or you were in the military and so therefore you have a language certificate from one of the good language programs um, that the US military uses. Uh, we are, um, uh, we, we routinely accept those as fulfillment of, um, of the six quarter proficiency as well. 
And then we give proficiency exams um, for people who uh, have grown up in bilingual households, for example, in the United States. So there's more than one way to fulfill that obligation uh, rather than trudging through six quarters of, of a language at UCSD. Trudging in the good way, don't mean a negative. So um, your lower division requirements in political science, these, um, these are, the, are, the, are the ones that we require um, uh, and you have to get it uh, a C minus or better in these. And, and the reason that it's these um, uh, that, we, that we look for is because this is really a great foundation uh, for develop for moving into the GPS core, uh, data analytics and political inquiry. Political inquiry is the old course um, of sort of research methods. Uh, the data analytics uh, uh, sort of uh, ratchets that up a little bit, and then of course comparative politics and international relations, so that you have both IR theory um, as well as some at least passing um, experience and thinking about the politics between countries, which is what comparative politics is. International relations includes international organizations. If you've taken courses, for example, with David Lake, um, um, but also um, the international, the sort of politics of, of international actors, comparative politics is the relations among states. And so sort of their politics on the ground. So. So this is, these are really the foundational courses um, and, and we expect you to have all of them uh, and, and with uh, passing grades. And then this is the curriculum uh, that applies to this program. Now, I'm sure Natalie will appreciate it if I'm, I'm very clear with you that this is the curriculum for those of you who want to do the BA MIA program. It's different from the required curriculum of any of the other tracks in the political science department. So if you are currently um, in the IR track and you're thinking you wanna do this, please make sure that you look at this, at these requirements because they are different. Um, we have a lot of people going, wait, what, I have to take American politics classes? Why didn't you tell me that? Um, I am telling you that now so that, so that you're not, um, uh, so that you don't get confused later and so that, so that Natalie continues to like to work with us and we make sure that um, you know what your requirements are. Um, but we do require two American politics classes. Why? Because you're much more likely to study institutions per se, which is to say institutions as institutions in American politics classes than you are in IR or comparative politics because the study of American government has typically been done through the lens of institutions, the interaction between institutions and uh, popular actors, individual actors, interest groups, uh, the politics of federal systems and so on. And because we do a lot of that, but take it out of just the United States and look, for example, at federal systems in other countries, India, for example, or the way that institutions determine uh, political activity. Why do you get certain, as I said a minute ago, certain kinds of policy outcomes in some, some countries and not in others? A lot of it has to do with constitutional and institutional design. And so you begin to get the feel of that in the American politics. Um, classes. So this is not, oh, we expect everybody to know something about the United States. Um, this really does have to do with a kind of what's adjacent uh, to taking those classes. And then um, pol international political economy, um, taking a class with someone like Simeon Nichter, uh, where you learn about the interaction between politics and economics at a state level either um, two classes in either international relations or comparative politics. So you have some familiarity with countries and how, how a country other than the United States makes policy. And then three elective courses. Um, and it's a fairly extensive list. Uh, it's not all inclusive of the political science department. So please also look at the lovely list that Natalie has put together and um, works hard to keep current for us. Um, thank you, Natalie. Um, uh, so that you, you know, so that you're able to really take some classes in the political science department because you're in one of the finest political science departments in the 
in the country, if not the world. And so you should, we do want you to explore the department that you're in. And so we want you to take some, um, some other elective courses in the things that you're particularly interested in. You can, you know, you can take courses in three different areas. You can come in with a depth in say policy analysis or a depth in the study of, of, of Latin America um, or political economy or development, that's fine, that's up to you. Um, but as long as you, you know, the, the, the first three of these are fairly set, two from IPE, two from, Ameri from these American politics courses, and two either in IR or comparative politics, and then you have three electives to play with. Okay, so even, um, so it's not too tightly constrained, but again, not the same requirements that you have um, in political science, so please keep that in mind, okay? And this is the, this is the core um, in, um, at, at GPS, and, and these are the core classes, the graduate courses that you'll take as seniors, as undergraduates, right? So this is why we want you to have um, all of your political science requirements done or near done by the time that you come in. Um, uh, this is a fairly standard set of courses. We are, GPS is known for being uh, at the cutting edge of methods courses. Um, we think that if you're going, the world operates on the basis of data. Whether you're interested in healthcare or you're interested in social policy or human rights, um, being able to look at data, deciding if it's any good, being able to make a policy recommendation based on that data requires that you know how data is put together, how it's gathered, how it's assessed, how it's been manipulated. Um, and so you have two quarters of quantitative methods. Um, QM2 involves learning how to code data. Microeconomics in the fall, international economics um, in the spring, so that you're really bookending, if you will, the sort of two primary uh, areas of economics that we look at. Uh, globalization is a course that's taught by one political scientist and one economics um, faculty. Um, and this really takes seriously the idea of the interaction between the migrations of labor and people and trade and international politics and is globalization good or is it largely bad or is it neutral? Um, how does, how do economic trade, you know, sort of economic uh, phenomena or business phenomena affect uh, political decision-making? How does security play into economic uh, policy-making, for example? Um, in the winter, you take, you'll see, uh, this is often surprising for a lot of people, a quarter of accounting and finance. Um, you may be saying to yourself, I didn't get a degree in political science so that I could take accounting. Um, but the, 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 the reality is that if you're serious in looking at economics or the e economic behaviors of states, you really do have to understand how businesses are run. Um, and how they're managed, how do they get profits. Um, it's very difficult, I think, to understand how not only capitalist but non-capitalist systems work and how they think about their role in the world without understanding how firms operate. And so we require you to take a quarter that um, gives you a little bit of accounting and a little bit of finance. And then um, uh, policymaking processes, which is one about you know, political acting and making. Uh, this is taught by uh, a series of political science faculty. Um, um, and, you know, again, looks at, com in a comparative way, looks at different systems. And then um, in the spring, international politics and security uh, that, you know, again, looks at the way in which uh, security threats as well as security policy interacts with decisions about um, uh, the relationships among states. Why, for example, are we very close relationships with some states? Do we have very close relationships with one states and not others? Why don't we just have a kind of real politique um, um, a yardstick by which we determine 
Uh, we should be very good friends with oil producing states and everybody else we don't care about because they don't really have anything. Why do we have strategic relationships um, in the, that take the configuration that they do? And so the way that we teach international politics and security involves those kinds of economic um, and business considerations. So it's a little bit different from the way that you'd be doing it uh, in the political science department. Okay. And then everybody um, has to have a career track. Now, for most of you, you'll be um, uh, fulfilling your career track requirements in your graduate year. Um, maybe you'll have time to take one or two classes in your senior year, depending on how you how you how hard you want to work and how many classes you want to take at a time. But these are the career tracks. Um, a career track is two required courses and three electives. And so these are typically ones that are, uh, the, the required courses are usually a sort of politics of and economics of. Um, so for example, in international economics, uh, there's one of the required courses is a class on trade. Um, and the other one is on fiscal and monetary policy. In other words, how do, how do states make, like how, who decides what a dollar is really worth abroad? You know, how do you, how do, uh, how do, how do currencies um, maintain their value uh, in the world? And so sort of policy making, um, uh, you know, in a broader world. Janet Yellen uh, gave her talk today. She's, she's, uh, as you know, been nominated by the Biden administration. And if you want to have a sense of the politics of uh, fiscal and monetary policy, go back and read her statement. Um, at her nominating hearing uh, today. It's, it's very interesting. Um, this stuff doesn't just happen. Uh, people make decisions about it. It's all a policy decision. International environmental governments. This looks at how decisions about environmental and energy policy gets made, um, as well as what the current state of that policy is. And again, going into the Biden administration, this is going to be di very different. Um, as we, as the United States moves back into the Paris Accord, um, uh, the conversations in these classes are going to look very different than they would have looked two years ago. International management is really an international business track, um, uh, but it is much more interdisciplinary than anything that you would get uh, in a business school. And so in addition to things like international business and marketing, uh, you also have things on, uh, for example, on um, uh, you know, do you, do you have open markets or closed markets? Um, uh, what, are trade agreements good for business or bad for business? How do they treat labor? And so again, we have a, you know, we have a fairly expansive definition of what we mean by management uh, that's quite specific to GPS. And then your regional specialization. Um, so again, you know, these, and by the way, I know that Korea, China, and Japan are not regions, um, uh, they're countries, um, you know that, right? Um, uh, but we have you, we require you to take one economics of, uh, so, so for example, with China, the social and economic development of China taught by Barry Naughton, but then also Chinese politics. Um, and so you have a sense of both the political, you know, sort of of the political economy of a country or a region. Um, and that's true across um, uh, all of these, all five of these. And then you have the language requirement. And we hold on to the language requirement because we think that it's important. Um, we're under no illusions that if you take only six quarters of Chinese, that you're probably not going to be able to work in Chinese if you were to say get a job in Beijing. Um, but, but learning a language means that you gain entrance in some ways to understanding the way in which the people who live in these places think about their own country and their own social norms and their political norms. And um, so studying a language means that you have access to some material that you wouldn't otherwise um, have to read. Um, uh, understanding the discourse in countries uh, it largely comes, you know, via language. It's a very important uh, transmission belt, if you will, uh, for, uh, for knowledge about other countries. And so that's why it's hard. It's easy to read the newspaper. It's hard to read a novel. 
you know, because the deeper you get into the language, um, uh, the more it requires a kind of cultural and social sensitivity. Um, but if that's true of reading, um, uh, it's much better to read Neruda in the original than in translation. If that's true, um, then it tells you something about the import of, of learning a language and understanding um, a culture and a, and a country, okay? So um, this very busy chart, um, and, and it is busy, it looks better um, uh, full screen than it does when I looked at it earlier. But this, but this is mostly to show you how the, first of all, it's to prove to you that it's possible to do this um, in five years um, and to show you uh, the organization of it that you not only have time to do your lower division work and your general education requirements, but there's also room in here um, uh, for electives along the way that you're not going to be nose to the grindstone uh, for five years if you came in as a freshman. And if you're a transfer student, hold on, the next slide is for you, so don't go anywhere. Um, uh, but you'll see, you know, that, that um, that it's that it's eminently doable. While it does require organization, meet today with Natalie. Um, while it does require a kind of organization, a thought about how you're going to schedule classes, it doesn't mean that you're only going to be doing only the requirements. And there are a couple of other things that I want to point out that are on here. Um, this shows you if you look at the third year, applying in April. Um, um, and then moving into your fourth year where you'll be taking the graduate core. And then you'll see in summer 2022, it says, um, my summer 2022. Um, oh yeah, no, that should be, that should actually say summer 2021. If, if you're, no, 20, if you're applying this year, it'll be summer 2022, that's correct. I'm mixing myself up. You have to take an internship in between your senior year and your year of graduate work. This is a mandatory internship. Um, all BA MIAs have to take them. And there are two reasons for that. One is because we think it's probably your first opportunity to really see whether the kind of work that you think you wanna do is something that you want to do. And so our career services, which is very skilled, helps you find and apply to internships in United Nations High Commission for Refugees, or you want to go to Mexico and work on transfer policy, or you want to go to the go to Hawaii for the summer and, and be at the Pacific Fleet Command, or uh, you want to stay in California and work for an energy company. We help you find your internship. We also help fund them. Um, it would be cruel to require one and dangle a bunch of cool uh, internships in front of you and then tell you that if you can't afford an airplane flight or you can't afford to live in Geneva that you can't do it. And so we do indeed help fund internships once you've found them. The other thing is that if you're coming into um, the graduate program as an undergraduate, uh, the chances are is that you don't have very much professional experience on your resume. So this allows you to have something on your resume so that when you start in your graduate year to look for a job, the job that you now hope you're going to have at the end of this program, um, you can now tell an employer that you have done an internship in the area uh, in which you're seeking work, that you have an experience, that you have a supervisor, that you know what the work is, okay? And here is the... Um, uh, the same thing for transfer students that shows you uh, the same thing, that it is possible uh, to, uh, to apply to the program. Now, if you come in um, uh, as a poli sci student, but you haven't done the lower division work, um, it, may, it may take you longer. Some transfer students um, uh, don't apply until their second year on campus. This has you applying in your first year on campus. That's fine. We can live with that. Um, as long as you don't mind, we don't mind. And if you come in without the lower division work or you come in needing a lot of your GEs, then, it be, then it's difficult to do it in exactly three years. Um, but we don't, uh, we don't hold that against you, okay?
So the application deadline this year is April 10th. Um, uh, you'll, when you look at the application um, online, um, you can get to it through the connect.graducsd. Uh, uh, it'll ask you to apply. Now, one thing that's very important is that we'll ask the, the only, if you apply this April, it's going to ask you to apply to fall of 2022. The reason for that is that you're actually applying to the graduate program. And if you apply this April, next year, you're still going to be an undergraduate, but that's correct to apply to fall of 2022. Um, because that's when you actually become a graduate student. So you're filling out the application now. We use it to assess you now, but it will, it will be formally a graduate application um, once you graduate with your bachelor's degree. And then we formalize your application to GPS by sending your application to graduate division where they approve it. So it can be a little confusing for people when they apply. We'll be doing an application workshop later on in the quarter, if you intend to apply this year, um, it's a good idea to come to that. One of the GPS admissions people will be there, okay? Um, you're required to do a statement of purpose uh, as it's explained here. It also allows you to do an optional set, um, essay. If there are things that you think matter to you that you want to address, um, uh, that's a good opportunity to do that. A resume, a transcript of your time uh, at UCSD. And if you went to another university or a community college, that transcript, and then two recommendations. It's a fairly standard um, uh, application. So if you're interested in the program, um, let me uh, suggest um, uh, that you make an advice, that you make an appointment with me so that we can talk about um, uh, how, what, what we look for when we look at applications, um, what a statement of purpose might look like, um, and make sure that you understand what your requirements are. Here it gives you, um, again, the outline of what we'll be looking for in terms of what you'll have finished by the time you start the core in your senior year, right? Um, and so this is, these are the, the application requirements sort of in a, you know, in a very um, efficient fashion. So strong GPA, um, uh, some, you know, the ability to talk with some knowledge about your interest in international affairs, how you got interested in it. Uh, coursework that you've taken that's kind of fed that interest, uh, what you want to be when you get out uh, with a master's degree. If you have relevant internship or volunteer work, we know that given both that you're undergraduates and that we've all been under house, more or less house, you know, lockdown for the last year, that the chances that you've been off and, and done um, internships out in the world are fairly slim. Uh, so don't panic over this. We're perfectly aware of the circumstances under which we're all operating right now. So not having had a research assistantship or an internship um, working somewhere, uh, this is not going to mean you don't get into the program, okay? Good recommendations. You want to ask people who are going to write you strong recommendations. Um, and an organized statement of purpose. And we will also have, I will have a statement of purpose workshop later in the quarter. And I'm happy to meet with anybody who wants to talk about what a good statement of purpose uh, should look like. Um, financial resources. One of the advantages of doing the five-year program is uh, first of all, that you get to go the first year of the program you do as an undergraduate and so pay undergraduate fees. Um, it also means that undergraduate financial aid, if you're using financial aid, will apply. Uh, there is also graduate um, level financial aid once you matriculate into graduate standing. It's more or less the same forms. Um, but they recalculate need. Uh, and, and if you do well in the core in your senior year, a number of you will find that you can get TA ships working as a teaching assistant um, in, your, in your graduate year will pay your tuition and fees. Um, we hire upwards of 30 students a year and various um, uh, you know, TA ships 
And it's a great way uh, to go to graduate school uh, without racking up a lot of debt, okay? And you can also, you know, political science is always looking for TAs and readers. Uh, if you have management experience, you can TA at Rady, for example, other departments on campus. And so there are opportunities uh, of paying your bills by, um, by being a TA. This is just a short list of, um, uh, of places where we currently have people working um, after they get their MIA. Uh, I spent last week an hour talking to an old um, uh, uh, student who was here in, at GPS in the 90s, then IRPS. Uh, who's coming in on 30 years of working for uh, the United Nations um, High Commission on Refugees. She's right now in her last tour uh, for them in Rwanda. She, before that, she was in Geneva. She's been in Eritrea, in East Timor. Um, I think this is her second or third tour actually um, in, in Africa. I think she was in South Africa for a while. Um, she's worked in various places in Asia. And, and so, you know, people leave and they do, they do very interesting things. Management consultants. Uh, we, have a, we have a graduate who is um, uh, in charge of policy analysis for YouTube's uh, music business. Um, uh, we have people who go into the foreign service, who go into investment, uh, investment consultants in international banks, research um, assistants at think tanks like Brookings and the World Bank. So lots of opportunities uh, for very interesting things. And we have a very good career services program uh, staff uh, that helps you think about what you're interested in and how to do what you're interested in in the right places. So this is just, um, uh, you know, the career services uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, the summer before you actually begin the core, you'll have to go through um, uh, a career development program. They begin the process of, of teaching you how to use their services. And they do um, career coaching. They bring in alums. They, they introduce you to people uh, who have... Uh, graduated from GPS who are helping uh, our students find jobs. They do workshops. Um, they drive you crazy in making sure that you have a perfect resume, um, uh, mock interviews. People complain about, oh, I have to do another draft of my resume, but that's the one that gets them a job. Um, they do outreach events. Hopefully, starting next year, we'll be able to travel again. So Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Washington, D.C., um, and as I said, there's funding for your internships and other kinds of professional development. We've had students, for example, uh, the last two years that the United States was still in the Paris Accord, go to Paris and go to the climate uh, meetings. Uh, we helped pay for them to get there. Um, uh, as, and that was you know, in the fall quarter. Uh, so they got to miss classes and go to Paris. How bad is that? Um, and so we work really hard to make sure that you're being positioned uh, for, um, you know, for the, for, the, for the career that you want. So here's how you can reach me. Um, this is my email address. Natalie, you should know how to reach through the back because uh, since you're all here, um, I'm assuming that you've all been involved, engaged with talking to Natalie in some way or another. Um, and you read your emails because we sent out the announcement um, uh, for today uh, via email. Good signs, all of you. And so I want to encourage you to send me an email. I'm happy to talk to you about your interest in the program, and I'm happy to answer questions that you might have. <laughs>